Okay, so we're now going to continue our discussion of visualization. P-I-S-U-A-L. And we left off by defining the idea of an arrow and then the idea of a stack. And if this arrow is A and this stack is B, we defined A dot B to be a real number. And what I forgot to mention, but it's really important, is this process that does it, right? The reason it's so important is because if I now extend, expand or contract the coordinate system, look what happens. The stack say I expanded the coordinate system, this stack will expand with the coordinate system and the arrow will contract with the coordinate system and the real number you get here won't change at all. It's invariant. And that is sort of the secret to all of this stuff. This stuff all has to be invariant to these arbitrary changes of coordinate system. And that really is not going to be a problem with expansion, contractions, and twistings and things. We're going to, it gets a little bit tricky when we start talking about reflections, however. And I'll have to say a few things about that in a moment. But, um, well, eventually I'll say, when it comes necessary, I'll say a few things about reflections. It won't be long. But the point is, is the reason that this is important is that this is invariant under the coordinate transformations, right? So if you try to create an operation, um, you have to make sure that the the operation it, it won't it doesn't give you any kind of possibly relevant answer unless that operation is invariant and that'll be a guidance for us for a lot of the other calculations. All right, so now that we've got that in pocket, um, we start wanting to think about these other vector spaces. Can we imagine, for example, uh, an operation on two arrows, right? So we're looking for something that would be a, I guess to define an operation, I'll call it uh, operation O that takes two arrows, right? Sort of like an inner product would. But remember, we don't, we don't have an inner product for this space. So this is an operation, well, I shouldn't put the same arrow there. Uh, maybe A and C, like that. So um, now an operation that takes two vectors, we know whatever that operation is. If it gives us a real number, if it gave us a real number, then that operation would be a member of a, uh, a 0, 2 tensor product space, right? But we don't necessarily have to get a real number out of it. We just have to get something that's invariant out of it. So we know that from elementary physics, we were happy to take an arrow and an arrow and create the cross product. If I called that A and C, I would go A cross product C, and that act equaled another arrow, which was D. And D actually had a magnitude, it was perpendicular to A and C, and it had a magnitude that was equal to the space of the sort of the subtended parallelogram, right? So that was very good when we had an inner product because we knew what perpendicular meant, right? So that was very helpful. And um, we could then place, unambiguously place this cross product arrow there and we could calculate this error without any trouble. And the problem now, of course, is if we, ch if we change, and, and also if we rotate the coordinate system, nothing here would be relatively affected. You'd still have the same logic, the same area, the same magnitude. But if you change the scale of the coordinate system in this case, right, say you changed it exactly the way we did before, everything got expanded, well, this area actually gets bigger. But it gets bigger by the square of the expansion, so d has to grow by the square of the expansion. And that's not linear, that's a nonlinear linear 
change based on the expansion. So, so that's a problem. But it, first of all, it changes, right? You change the coordinate system, this numerical area gets bigger, this guy gets bigger. So, um, so that's a bit of an issue, right? And therefore, having this arrow represent... Um, it, it can't be an arrow because it's changing by the square of the expansion, first of all. And, and there's this issue of perpendicularity. So all of these things are a bit of a problem. So what Weinreich tells us to do is he says, well, we're going to create a new object. We're going to say, all right, we're just going to have to invent a new object. And this object is actually quite a little bit more abstract than even the two objects, well, than the stack and the arrow. This object is going to be, I don't know why I'm erasing it, why not I just go to a new screen. This object is going to be something he calls a thumbtack. Uh, one word. The thumbtack is, uh, is his new type of vector. It is a vector, right, because it lives in a vector space, right, and you can add them. You can multiply them by real numbers. They, um, uh, it turns out that the, thumb, the question of how many dimensions is the thumbtack, that's something we still have to think about. Uh, the foreshadowing part is that I'm going to tell you that a thumbtack is an element of V wedge V. And because we're dealing with three, V has three dimensions, turns out that V wedge V has three dimensions. So thumbtacks are two vectors. All right. So that's a bit of a foreshadowing. He doesn't do this, right? When you read Weinreich, he doesn't show you this. He just says, we're going to create a thing called a thumbtack. And a thumbtack has to be understood in a very abstract way as a little slice of area with a direction attached to it. So a stack is, these, is totally different than a stack. A stack is an infinite plane, set of planes. I really should make these look like planes if I can. God, this is just kind of... I'm no artist, I know it. So, so that's an infinite stack of planes uh, with a direction. I've put the direction this way for a change, right? That's totally different than this thing. This thing is a completely contained little piece of area whose shape is totally unspecified, but whose area is specified. And now, as a vector, its component is the, uh, the area of this little piece of plane, right? The component of this was the density of the sheets, right? The component of the arrow was the length... Um, uh, essentially the length of the arrow, right? I'm talking, of course, about the unit ones, right? Um, these things can have more than one components, but the components are always referring to densities in, in uh, basis directions, lengths in basis directions. And this guy is going to be a little piece of, of um, area in basis directions. So there will be three of them, right? Um, and those three will be little pieces of area, area like this, like this, and I guess like this, sort of coming out at us, right? And any thumbtack is going to be some linear combination of those, so I could create a thumbtack like this, and it'll be some linear combination of these basis thumbtacks. So what Weinreich wants us to do to understand the thumbtack is we consider two arrows, A and B, and the thumbtack is the completed parallelogram given a direction. And that direction is something we need to talk about first, but that is your sort of elementary thumbtack. And in fact, if A is the basis vector E1 of the underlying vector space V, and B is the basis vector E2, then the thumbtack will be 
this parallelogram, although it's a projection, would actually be a little square, and it would be given a direction where, for, for right now, we're going to use the right-hand rule. He wants this to be A cross product B equals uh, what he would call the thumbtack, which is C which is with a little circle. That's his thumbtack, right? So B with that would be a stack with a line underneath. With an arrow, we have a vector, but we have a little circle, we have a thumbtack. So we've created a new vector object, and it's not an arrow, right? In elementary physics, in the cross product, as I just showed, that, oops, I erased it, didn't I? <clears throat> that extra vector, that cross product, is a third vector. And in fact, it uses the same basis. It would be... E3, in this case, if it was E1 and E2, the cross product would be E3, right? He says, no, you can't do that because you change the coordinate system and E3 doesn't vary uh, um, as an arrow would. It varies as the square of the change, not uh, linearly with the change like an arrow does. So it's not an arrow, but it is a thumbtack because a thumbtack, um, the... Uh, uh, it changes based on the area, right? This this area here. So, do 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 do. So, um, so that's uh, a new type of vector that he introduces. Now, about the right hand rule here, <clears throat> this is a big a bit of a problem because the right hand rule, the right. I'll write this down here. The right hand rule is arbitrary, right? And that's a problem because everything here is supposed to be canonical, right? It's not canonical. Uh, canonical, two C's? Hold on, let me check. No, canonical has one C, as usual too much time studying math and not enough time <clears throat> reading and writing. Okay. And doing art. So, um, canonical, uh, so the right hand rule is not canonical. Now, it turns out that this can all be traced to something called orientation. Orientation orientation of our underlying space. What we're basically doing is we're choosing an orientation, which means we're saying E1, E2, and E3. We're going to take our basis vectors in those orders, and we are going to decide ultimately that the top form, E1 wedge, E2 wedge, E3, that this is the positive uh, orientation. So any anything, any top form that this is the basis vector of the three form, right? Any three form that is a, a positive, uh, has a positive component. Uh, remember, it's all th the three form in the three dimensional space is one dimensional. So you either have positive or negative components on this one dimensional basis vector. If it's positive, we say the orientation is right handed or positive. If it's negative, the orientation is left handed. So if you started to screw around with the coordinates, you if the top form changes from positive to negative, you've flipped orientations. The point is we're choosing one of those orientations as positive. And the orientation we're choosing is this E1, E2, E3, and that gives us ultimately the right-hand rule, which allows us to put arrows on things. You don't have to do this. The problem with not doing this is you introduce another kind of of directionality, right? Right now we have a directionality that is a little arrowhead. The alternative directionality is something called a curly Q. And you could have curly Q stacks or arrowhead stacks. It turns out that any curly Q hat can be turned into an arrowhead stack if you've established an orientation. And you can't always establish an orientation. In some, in some problems of more mathematical problems, uh, orientation, for example, a Mobius strip, you can't really orient all things on a Mobius strip. And um, uh, in those cases, you kind of do have to do the curly Q version and the arrowhead version. For the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to do everything with 
arrowheads, assuming an orientation. So we're going to use the right-hand rule a lot. And this will just cut down, literally cut down the number of lectures in half, because not having to go through this curly Q arrowhead thing is, uh, is a big savings. And also, it's the curly Q arrowhead version is actually somewhat esoteric and not generally necessary. But in principle, in principle, there's two types of thumbtacks. There is this thumbtack here, and there is this thumbtack type here. Now, the two we are equating these two using the right-hand rule, where this direction, with if you put your right hand and wrap your fingers, you'll get your thumb pointing in this direction. So we are equating these two because we have an orient because we're presuming that we have an oriented. Uh, space-time, an oriented manifold. Our vector space is oriented to, is, uh, likewise. Uh, meaning the ultimately ultimately goes to you we have our our manifold, our this is our space-time manifold, this is our our space, I guess in three dimensions, and it has a coordinate system, and on that coordinate system we create we create uh, vector spaces at every point using the coordinate basis. And we've chosen an orientation that decides which collections of basis vectors are positively oriented or negative. And there's only two choices because the top form is one-dimensional. So all components of the top form, if this was the component of dx1 wedge, dx2 wedge, dx3, A is either positive or A is negative. So whatever chord, whatever basis vectors we choose, once we've selected one of them to be positive, everything will either be positive or negative, even if the, there's an infinite number of different possible bases, but all of them are in one of two equivalence classes, the positive equivalence class or the negative equivalence class. So once we've done that, we can then use the right-hand rule to equate curly cues with arrows. And I'm not going into the details of all of that now, but suffice to say for this lecture, everything's going to have an arrowhead on it, right? Everything's going to have an arrowhead like this on it. And, um, that's, but when I invoke the right-hand rule, I realize it's arbitrary and non-canonical, but I'm making the presumption that we have an oriented manifold. And once we do, then everything is okay. All right, so uh, where was I? Oh, yes, we've created the, uh, the thumbtack vector space. So, um, now the point is, is that once you create a thumbtack vector space, right, once you've created this thing by the cross product of two arrows, you've got its own thing, right? You don't need the cross product of two arrows to make a thumbtack. It's an arbitrary, it's not arbitrary, it's a, it's its own type of vector. And the only thing that characterizes it is the area of this little surface, not the shape right? The, the, it's not described by a circle or a square, just like these planes are infinite and the only thing that matters is the density. The only thing that matters here is the area of that thing. It does not have any extension in the true space, just like, just like before, at this point, at this point, we have a uh, vector space and it is the two form, the space of two forms, it's three-dimensional, and it has its own basis. Now, you and I know that the basis of this thing is going to be d1 wedge d2, d2 wedge d3, and uh, d3 wedge d1, I guess. And, um, and it's a real vector space, and these are the three basis vectors, right? Um, now, if you go back to our little lesson on determinants, this kind of makes sense because we know that these things can be represented as parallel pipettes. And in two dimension, and if there's if it's a, if there's um, uh, two of them, that parallel pipette's a parallelogram. If there were three, it would be a little unit parallel pipette volume, right? So this kind of makes sense based on our our the lecture back on in the day on determinants. These little vectors wedged together do in fact form volumes, and a two-dimensional volume is an area, and that's really what these things are. So these guys are the unit vector thumbtacks, the unit vector thumbtacks. 
Now notice what he's calling a cross product, A cross B, we would actually call A mu E mu wedge A or B nu E nu, like that, the wedge product of two vectors. So his, his cross product is our wedge product. Now, but what, but what he has done is he said, no, no, this equals a new thing called a thumbtack. So he does call this thing a thumbtack, which is better than calling it some other vector, because it's not. It's a, he's defining this thing called a thumbtack. And in, in our work, we don't have to define anything new. This operation creates the new thing, right? It creates e mu wedge e nu. That's what that is, right? So our definition is far more fundamental than his. He creates a new thing. We have an operation that is its own thing. But the elementary physics thing is this, this vector here, which is a little odd because it's not its own thing. It's the same thing. So it turns out that um, if we want to recover this object here, we can take the Hodge dual of A wedge B. That will, uh, that'll get us there um, because remember the Hodge dual is going to go from this back into the original vector space if you have three dimensions, right? Because in three dimensions, you have uh, V and V wedge V and V wedge V wedge V and the Hodge dual and then zero. The Hodge dual goes like this and like that, right? So uh, when you read about this in, in some standard text, you'll see that this is the so-called cross product of elementary physics. But Weinrich's cross product is not that. Weinrich's cross product is actually uh, kind of a twisted variant on our wedge product where he's just defining this new type of vector. And it's a totally clean way of doing it. What he's trying to do is he's trying to create a bunch of new objects to satisfy all these requirements of invariance. And he even points this out. It's like every time you turn around, you have to create a new object in his system. But eventually, you do, in fact, create all the objects you need. And according to him, there's seven uh, different new objects. Um, we might have to wrestle with uh, the number between seven and six when we review it ourselves. But knowing what we know, this is very easy, right? Weinrich's analysis is very simple when we uh, break it down using our analysis. So that is the thumbtack, and that is the third vector space. So now... If um, we have our point A in space-time, we now have the vector space of arrows. We now have the vector space of stacks. And we now have the vector space of thumbtacks. T-H-U-M-B. Thumbtacks. Thumbtacks. And arrows, uh, A with an arrow, stacks, uh, B with a stack, thumbstacks, C with a little circle. All, notice that they're all three dimensional, right? It could have been, it could have been that we might have ended up here with something that had a, a more dimensions, there may have been more dimensions in this thing's a vector, right? So there may have been more dimensions in its vector space than in this vector space. And um, uh, that could happen here, right, if the object on the left and the object on the right don't come from the same place, right? Well, let's see, this guy has three dimensions, this guy has three dimensions. The wedge product between the two has a different number of dimensions, right? Except in three-dimensional space, it just so happens that the wedge product between a three-dimensional space in a three-dimensional space, that wedge product also has three dimensions. That's unusual. So the fact that thumbtacks has three dimensions, three, whoops, three dimensions, three dimensions, three dimensions, that's unusual. It's not unusual that these two have the same number, right? Because that's V 
V star, but the fact that V wedge V has three dimensions, that's unusual. That's not guaranteed. These two are guaranteed, right? Okay, so um, those are his thumbtacks. Now, I will point out that Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler, MTW, they don't really address thumbtacks head on. They do refer to areas as vector wedge vector. So they will think of this in terms of, of a little parallelogram U and V. Uh, but they don't identify it specifically as its own little visualization uh, item. But they do want you to understand that the wedge product of two vectors is in fact a parallelogram, understood to be a parallelogram in an area, but they just launch right into sort of the obvious truth of it based on our understanding at least of determinants. And they, the presumption is you could do this in higher dimensions as well. But Weinreich actually creates its, his own little vector visualization for this thing, and he calls it a thumbtack. And it is true that Again, the area of this object, this thing here, really is, is the shape is not intended to be an actual literal parallelogram. It's just supposed to have the quality of an area uh, or of a volume, really. Um, and that's the whole thing we did about the determinants that I mentioned before, right, is, you know, you change the dimensions of these things and the volume of it changes uh, correctly. And you change the angular relationship and the volume tends to zero despite the fact that none of the sides of it necessarily go to zero. So Meister Thorne and Wheeler doesn't nail down this thumbtack as an I separate vector space. So he's got it, uh, he's, uh, his, their, their book is a little bit more, um, a little higher level. It's, it's leaning in the material that we've been studying. Okay, so let me erase that. <clears throat> and um, then what I should say is that thumbtacks all of these things have their own their own algebra. When I say an algebra, I mean that you can add them together and you can multiply them by real numbers. That's the vector, well, the vector mathematics. I probably should stay away from the word algebra. But uh, they all have their own addition and they all have their own uh, scalar multiplication. And for thumbtacks, you know, if I have a thumbtack like this, and a thumbtack, let's see, I'll, I'll use the example Weinreich uses, a thumbtack like this, I can add them together by first turning them into nice rectangles, and then they share an edge, putting the arrow on the two edges, like that, and then um, <clears throat> uh, I have to sort of wedge them in between, remember, it's all geometry here, that's what you get, if you want visualization, you've got to sort of stick with the geometry. I wedge them between two planes so that this line here, this line here, and that line there, and that line there are wedged against two parallel planes, right? These are parallel planes. And the parallel planes cannot, of course, contain the thumbtack, but they just have to be parallel. And then I ultimately end up with a triangle, right? I end up with this, this side, this side, and then I can create this side, and then that thing there will be the new thumbtack, and I give it a direction that's consistent with the other two directions. Now, I've kind of thought about this a little bit. You know, what if we're adding, say, this thumbtack to this thumbtack? Same, same thumbtack, but going the other way, right? And um, uh, in, in this case, what you're doing is you're merging these two sides together, right? And so you end up with this essentially, well, if it was a perfect overlap, it would be overlapping this, and you would get the zero thumbtack, right? So the thumbtacks have an opposite, and you get zero because it doesn't form a triangle. But you can imagine this thumbtack with this thumbtack with an arrow like that, right, going down. And what you do um, is you really want these arrows to be 
because uh, these these areas are going to cancel is the point if the uh, if the arrows go in a different direction. And what you would ultimately get in this circumstance is uh, a little thumbtack like this, I suppose, and its arrow would go in the direction of these two arrows, which would be something like that. So thumbtacks can be added, and uh, it's just a geometrical method of adding it because everything's geometry now. And um, Weinreich shows how that's done. And of course, uh, multiplying by a scalar would just be taking this area, that area A, say, and making it a little bit bigger. So if that area was originally A, this would now be uh, C times A, some constant times A. Now in our world, what this is, is that area is E1 wedge E2. Um, and uh, it's got some area, and that would be A12 with maybe uh, strict components, A12. And it's a vector, so we just multiply by C, and that's all we do. And this thing here represents the E1, E2 thumbtack, which is not a problem if we think of things in terms of E1 and E2. There's our thumbtack. It's... Um, uh, in the cross product language, it would be sort of an area whose normal would be a vector E3, right? It doesn't equal E3, its normal would be E3 if we were to go way back into our elementary physics thing. So <clears throat> that completes the uh, thumbtack description, right? So for all of these, we now have the geometric description, right, which is arrows, stacks, and thumbtacks. Dimensionality, we have the algebraic relations, addition and scalar multiplication. We have its own little symbol, and we have established what uh, vector space we're actually dealing with based on our understanding of uh, vectors and covectors. So what's missing? Well, now we're missing the two forms. So let's look at that one. So just as he, when I say he, I mean Weinreich, just as Weinreich created the dot product between a vector and a stack to give us a scalar, he then created what he called the cross product between two vectors, uh, two vectors, and that was a thumbtack. And um, so the cross product was between two like objects, in his words, like objects. And remember, he's creating these symbols and he's using these symbols under his own definition, right? So this is not the cross product of standard physics and, and, and basic uh, vector calculus. It's not that cross product. It's, a diff it's his own cross product because, and you know, because this guy is not a vector. This guy is a thumbtack. It's a member of a different vector product space or vector space. Um, and likewise, uh, this dot product is unlike objects. Now, it's not just that they're like or unlike. It's that um, uh, they're related by sort of their nature. Clearly, we're having, right so far, we have an arrow-like thing, and we have two area-like things, right? The stack is sort of an area-like thing, and the thumbtack is certainly an area-like thing. So, um, you might, it might be that these are uh, arrow-like things times arrow-like things, and this is arrow-like thing times area-like thing, right? And sure enough, that is going to be the case, right? Arrows penetrate stacks to give real numbers. So you can imagine arrows could penetrate areas also, but one arrow penetrating one area doesn't tell us anything, right? It's got to be the number of areas that it penetrates. That's why arrows combine with stacks. But you could imagine a lot of arrows penetrating a small area, and then you count the number of arrows that penetrate an area, sort of the complement of the number of stacks penetrated by a single arrow. Whoops. Right, the number of stacks penetrated by a single arrow has sort of this complementary idea of a lot of arrows penetrating a little limited area. So all of these things are, in fact, in fact, what we're going to get to. So now, um, what about a stack uh, 
cross product with a stack. And by cross product, I mean an operation that takes like objects. So what would such a thing be? Well, let's, since it's geometry, it's got to be forced on us, right? It's got to be canonical, which I've learned has only one end. Canonical. Um, it's got to be canonical. So how would you take a stack? Let me try to be a little dimensional about it. How would you take a stack and say another stack? Do, do, like that. I'll just make the other stack a little bit, well, a little bit smaller. How would you take two stacks and combine them in some way? And you could literally just do it, right? You could just take this picture and if my, I better just go with the single lines. If that's one stack and this is another stack, well, why don't I just Take that grid. It's not really a grid, right? It's actually a series of a series of it's a series of tubes, like the internet, right? It's a series of tubes. And and that I could call why don't I call it um uh a honeycomb, right? Or maybe not a honeycomb. Well, I guess honeycomb's okay. I mean, honeycomb's I think of as hexagonal, but uh, and that really definitely would not work here. But it's sort of this honeycomb structure. And, um, you know, that's not crazy because remember what we did with the thumbtack is we took the two arrows and we just said, okay, we're going to create this combination of the two arrows. So we kind of left the two arrows there and sort of completed the structure and created the thumbtack. Well, that's sort of what we're doing here. We're leaving the two structures there, and we're taking seriously, looking at two of them together. Now, that's different than adding them. Remember, adding them involved taking one, taking another, and then creating a third set of planes one way or another that was the sum of the two, right? And that's not the same, right? Because you, you didn't really leave them both in place. You just sort of found a set of planes that represented the sum of the two sets you already had. What we're actually dealing is we're actually this time we're actually leaving them there and taking seriously the full structure. And indeed these planes do have these intersections, right? They do have these intersections. Now you can stop there and you can say that's that's the cross product that is the well that is the cross product. I, I always want to emphasize we're not dealing with the standard Euclidean cross product of vector cross uh, vector, right? I've said that a bunch of times, but it, every time I say the word cross product, I'm so focused on this, this pops into mind and having to negate that thought comes out, so I have to say it. But this is what we might mean by the cross product or some operation that takes two like objects, or in this case a stack and a stack, and produces something that we could call, I guess, we could call it a honeycomb, right? So let's consider that. Let's consider calling it a honeycomb. Now the thing about the honeycomb is that, um, that that's a very descriptive word, but it's not actually what one Weinrich does. He does something different. This, this is a difference between Weinrich and Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler. Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler leaves it as the honeycomb, and they're very happy to have it as a honeycomb. And it's perfectly well understood as a honeycomb. It does have a direction, though. And the direction of the honeycomb is related to the direction of the two planes as given by the right-hand rule. So what I would do with the right-hand rule is I would have these planes going like this. Now that's equal density, of course, right? And then, say, uh, you know, these planes going like this, right? <clears throat> and I create this, this honeycomb-like structure. And, now of course, the honeycomb is coming out of the board, right? I guess you would say it's coming out of, uh, uh, out of the, um, the whiteboard here. And 
if this guy is oriented like this, then I want to, and I'm saying, uh, and this, I guess I have to label everything. So the black one is stack A, wine, uh, cross product in wine rick ascents, and the blue one is stack B, then the honeycomb structure, uh, which, uh, hmm, what will I, how will I do that? I'll say C, honeycomb will be, because Weinreich doesn't uh, use honeycombs, but he does give things symbols, so I got it, and I'm kind of stuck. So that would have been a thumbtack. He's already done the thumbtack, so, so why don't I, instead of, I'll put a square under it for the honeycomb, or how about a little thing like that, there, honeycomb. So C is sort of a honeycomb. Um, but the directionality on C, right, has to be either, uh, 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 has to be a bit of a circulation. And that circulation is going to be the right-hand rule from A to B. So here's A, and there's B, and by my right hand, my thumb comes out of the board. Now, um, in uh, Meister, Thorne, and Wheeler, he actually takes this curly Q and puts it in there as a curly Q uh, to give directionality of the honeycomb. The honeycomb has sort of a rotation. But because we've established an orientation for everything, I'm going to take that rotation and I'm just going to right hand rule it and I'm going to give it an arrow, right? So this honeycomb construction, which I'll draw one exemplar honeycomb like that, it actually has an arrow on it coming out this way. It's a little bit easier, perhaps, to write a circulation that's consistent with the right-hand rule. Either of those is equivalent. In other words, this circulation and this arrow are equivalent under our right-hand rule prescription, our non-canonical right-hand rule prescription. And Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler will give you this curly Q. But, and ultimately, um, Weinreich doesn't do this. Weinreich has a different picture of this. But I want to stick with Meisner, Thorne, and Wheelers for a moment because clearly what we're looking at here in his opera, in um, this is sort of a hybrid now, right? This is a stack Weinrich notation, stack Weinrich notation, stack cross product Weinrich notation, but then I go to this honeycomb, which is Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler, right? But uh, it doesn't matter because all these things are this, are, I mean, this isn't a problem because what we're ultimately going to do is I'm going to say, this guy is a form, right? This is our wedge product of two forms. This guy is a form. And the result is, um, is a two form, right? The two form, A, well, a two form, I don't even need to call it A, I'll call it um, T mu nu E mu wedge E nu, like that. So this is what's really going on here we're creating a two form from two one forms. And that is a stack and a stack. And this guy here is this thing, which we are now visualizing as this honeycomb structure. And remember, again, it's a honeycomb structure that exists in its own little vector space. It's now at the point A, we now have a tensor product space um, of two forms. And that is the V star wedge V star tensor product space. And it so happens this thing has three dimensions, it's a real, and it has its own addition and its own scalar multiplication property. Now, how would you add two honeycombs together? There's another art to that. Um, we'll, we'll maybe get to that in a moment. But uh, one new thing does happen with honeycombs that is important. And that is the, the idea of a, um, of a simple honeycomb or uh, a not a simple honeycomb. So let's quickly talk about that. Uh, well, all right, well, maybe before we do that, we should look a little bit more about these, these honeycombs. You can remember we're, we're looking at these honeycombs edge on, all right? So we have this and this, which would give us. Uh, so, so what's the characteristic of the honeycomb, right? It's really, in a way, it's a density, right? It's the number, it's the number of these squares that we have now. That's the new thing, right? 
it was the density of this and the density of this. Now it's the density, the number of these little squares per unit area, right? So the component of the honeycomb is sort of the, the density of these squares. And um, this, will, this is where the density will be uh, at a maximum, but we can imagine this circumstance where we have this, well, I, I, I need arrows on these things, don't I? So there's an arrow there, there's an arrow there. So we have this, but now let's say the other one is much less dense. Right? That's, so that's one way to sort of reduce the density of these areas. Right? There's, very, there's fewer of these areas per, um, per, per, uh, there's, there's fewer of these honeycomb cells. I guess that should be the word. These are, we'll call them cells, right? There are fewer cells per unit area. Okay? Um, uh, cells. Right? And call them cells. <clears throat> and remember the cells have a circulation. In this case, the circulation would look like that if it was, if this was, uh, whoops, A stack and B stack. This would, the cell would uh, have an orientation like this. Remember, this symbol means it's coming out of the board. This symbol means it's going into the board, right? Um, but another way to do this is you could have two stacks of the same density, but they're almost going in the same direction, too, right? <clears throat> like that. And uh, that would actually have less cell density than this, although I may not have drawn it that way. Um, eventually, you can you can see that uh, uh, you almost get zero density when you have a stack like this and then a stack like this, right? Very close in direction, right? So uh, the stack, the, uh, the cell density is, is very sensitive to the alignment of the two stacks. But that, of course, is exactly like a thumbtack, right? The thumbtack, you can have two very long vectors, but if they're very close together, this parallelogram is going to have almost no area, right? So it's the very everything is very much the same um, uh, in, in, in... It's all complementary, right? It's all complementary between these stacks and these arrows. Um, but... Uh, uh, but again, um, uh, it's these it's these cells that the density of these cells ref is what the measurement of a honeycomb is. So this component of e mu wedge e oops I guess it's e mu wedge e nu right. This component here that is this cell density. Now. The way Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler then goes is he now talks about, okay, so you've got this honeycomb, right? You've got this honeycomb-like structure. And God, I really, it's, it's hard to draw, but let me, let me say I, I'm going to just, just for, to make it simple, I'm going to kind of draw it like this, right? Which is actually okay, because the structure doesn't have to, as long as all the area in there is accounted for. So if you have this honeycomb-like structure, and you drive it through an area, you're going to be able to count the number of cells of the honeycomb-like structure that go through the area. Now, the way I've done it, these things really should be squares, right? And this should actually be straight. And when I say this should be like this and this should be like that, it means I should redraw it, right? So we have some arbitrary area and if I drive a honeycomb through it, I'm going to get some collection of cells, right? And this goes on through the whole thing. And I'm going to be able to count the number of these cells that go through, that go through our area, right? And that, so this is the, 
this is the arbitrary area here. And again, if you know there, there's fractional cells, so don't worry about the fact that you only get part of a cell. You can count that fraction. And if you know it's a little bit like uh, some sort of integration, but um, ultimately, I can count the number of cells that go through an area, which is which is our thing that's very similar to the number of planes that are cut by an arrow. I now have the number of of essentially cells that go through a piece of plane. Now, these are complementary ideas, and this is the one Meisner and Thorne and Wheeler work with. It's not the one that Weinrich works with, right? Weinrich works with a different one, though. What he wants to say is he wants to, and it's all a matter of visualization, so whichever one is better for you, but it's interesting to see the distinctions. Um, the, uh, what Weinrich wants to do is he wants to take these planes, and there's, say, one set there, and then he wants to take the other set here, this, which I'll maybe put it that way. And he wants to say, you know what? What's interesting to me is not the honeycomb. He wants to take, these are all planes, right? So there's intersections here, like this. He, he doesn't want to take the honeycomb structure he just wants to take these lines of intersection, right? That's all he wants to do. And he doesn't want to say, oh, the whole honeycomb structure is what I care about. He only cares about this stream of lines that are the intersections of these planes. And he puts an arrowhead on each of these lines and the direction of that arrowhead is the right-hand rule. So just as this would have been, say, that uh, curly Q circulation, which we then translate into an arrow by the right-hand rule, he would uh, be happy to just start with the right-hand rule on his arrows, right? Because he doesn't, he doesn't draw this honeycomb thing. He draws arrows everywhere. So... In his world, he's taking arrows penetrating through an area, which is much more of a complement to this idea, yeah, actually. So he likes this arrows coming through this idea. And he doesn't call it a honeycomb like Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler do. By the way, Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler's word, use of the words honeycomb is very descriptive. He doesn't literally create a vector space called the honeycomb space, which is what, I'm, which is what I kind of have done. He just uses it as a, as a description. But Weinreich, he does create a word for this one, and he calls it a sheaf. And it's very important. This is a sheaf. Th this is what a sheaf is, right? There's, there's a, a, an abstract mathematical concept called a sheaf that's not related to this. This is the sheaf. The sheaf is this collection of arrows that are represented by the intersections of these two one forms. So these, and in Weinreich's language, you have these two stacks that are combined by a cross product, and that result is a sheaf. So in his world, the cross product of a stack A with a stack B equals a sheaf. And he uses a double arrow for a sheaf. Right? So that solves my problem that I had back here, where I had to create a symbol for the honeycomb. Now we don't. Now we just call it a sheaf. And these are two you can see that these are damn similar concepts, right? I mean, why would why not keep a honeycomb and count the areas or keep a sheaf and count the arrows? The characteristic of this is the density of cells, but here it's just the density of lines. In fact, I could take all these lines and shift it to the middle of each cell instead of at the intersection. I'd have the same sheaf, um, and then it would just be like, threading each tube with a line, right? Threading each tube with a line, and that's the equivalent sheaf. 
So these two are very similar pictures, and I would just count the number of lines that penetrate um, the unit area. And any deformation, will the number of lines will be preserved, because if there's a line that doesn't penetrate that, um, that circle, say there was this blue line here that doesn't penetrate that area, no homeomorphic demi, uh, 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 no homeomorphic manipulation of the space is ever going to bring that line across and inside that curve. Um, homeomorphic is a topological term that if you did the manifold series, you understand. So the point is, is the number of arrows that penetrate this is never going to change no matter how much you manipulate the space. So you have this sheaf idea, which is exactly the same as Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler's honeycomb idea. So what is the difference and what's going on? Well, first of all, I've kind of jumped the gun a little bit because I've been talking about the number of cells that penetrate an area or the number of arrows that penetrate an area. So what am I talking about there? Let's uh, have a quick look at that first and then see if we can figure out what the relationship is between these two pictures. So I guess the part that I need to cover now, I guess the order of all this stuff is kind of tricky. I'm going in sort of a free-form order here. So what I've already sort of introduced is this notion of a dot product between two unlike objects, right? Uh, the dot product is between an unlike objects of a honeycomb and a thumbtack, right? So what I've got to introduce now, I suppose, is a honeycomb, which would I guess we'll call a honeycomb dot product with B thumbtack, right? And that's going to be uh, an element of the real numbers. And it's going to be invariant. And you can see why it might be invariant without too much trouble if, um, if I expand the coordinate system, this area is going to grow, but the density of the cells is going to drop. And I've said everything is equivalent, so this thing needs to be equivalent to, say, a sheaf A and a thumbtack B. Now, a thumbtack is an area, right? So what I'd be looking at is, let's try it this way. I have an arbitrary thumbtack, right? It's, vol it's well, that's not a good, I, I'm trying to make it so you understand that the area, is, the shape is not important, it's just the area. So there's my thumbtack. And I can look at it in two ways. I can look at it as a thumbtack that is embedded in this honeycomb structure. Right, maybe I'll just do it like this. And there's this honeycomb structure, and the honeycomb structure penetrates the thumbtack. Oh, God, this is terrible. And the question is, is how many of these honeycombs, when we project it on the thumbtack, actually go through, right? How many of these cells go through the thumbtack? Right? So if I change the coordinate system, the thumbtacks area grows, but the density of this guy drops, and you end up with a constant number, right? A constant number of these honeycomb tubes go through the thumbtack, and that is the dot product of a honeycomb with a thumbtack. And in our language, in the language that we've been working with, the thumbtack is the wedge product of two vectors. So the thumbtack, uh, a thumbtack, is really, say, v, well, uh, the vector w wedge vector uh, z, right? And the honeycomb is the wedge product of two forms. So the honeycomb, uh, b honeycomb, that's really defined as alpha wedge beta, right? But, so alpha wedge beta is a member of V star wedge V star, and this is V wedge V, 
right? So again, we think of this as an area, and we think this is of, of as a uh, honeycomb where density is what's important, right? So sort of volume is what is important here, density is what is important here. And um, this is the dual space of this, right? So we are actually thinking of this in terms of A wedge B, which is a member of the dual space of this. So it's looking for a two vector to gobble up. So it, this is the name of something. So now this is the argument list, and the argument list is going to be W wedge Z. Or maybe I should write it, I could actually mix the notations, right? I could say alpha wedge beta is the two form, and it gobbles up a thumbtack. But of course, a thumbtack is a member of that space. So that's what's important is the, um, uh, as a reminder, the wedge, or the tensor product of the duals is the dual of the tensor product for finite dimensional vector spaces. In a, or a, certainly in a, uh, if you have a finite list of them in a finite dimensional vector space, that's, this is the dual space of this. So how would I write that? I'd write V wedge V, whoops, it looks like for all, V wedge V, that vector, that's a tensor product space. It's uh, an exterior power space, but it's a tensor product space, so it has, so it's a vector space, so it has a dual, and that dual is V wedge V star. So I'm actually, this is a dual, so the point is, this is a dual space mapping between these, the given by this expression, which is also given by this expression, and it's a dual space mapping, so it gives you a real number. And it's an invariant real number. And it varies because as you change the coordinate system, you still, uh, the, the, this, this, the density of this changes oppositely to the area of that. And as long as it's a homeomorphic change, you'll never uh, slip in additional honeycombs inside an area. So that sort of starts completing this picture a little bit. We've now got this thing, but it also works with sheaves, right? Because if I had thought of this now as a sheaf, I have our same thumbtack area, but instead of honeycombs, now it's easy to draw, right? Because I just draw these arrows, right? And these arrows you could think of as either threading every honeycomb tube or you could think of them as, you could either think of them as threading the tubes like this, or you could think of them as on the intersections of tubes like that. So one, either one of those will, will work, because it's only the density of these arrows that matter. And again, the density of these arrows only changes in accordance to, uh, it doesn't change if, if the, um, if the uh, coordinate change system changes in scale in one direction, these arrows, the density doesn't matter. The density is only sensitive to changes in uh, the scale of the coordinate system transversely to their direction. Likewise here, the density of the cells only matters in the transverse direction. It's the same darn picture, right? But here you have arrows and here you have honeycomb. However, it's not actually the same mathematical structure. It's... Um, they're related mathematical structures. The honeycomb is related to these arrows. But, um, but before we get to that, I can go back here, and I now have sheaf uh, this here, this sheaf dot product with a thumbtack. Um, that's what this picture is. So here I would write a sheaf dotted with b thumbtack where here, as I wrote, uh, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, no, hold on. I might as well try to be a little consistent, right? This is, um, this, this one over here is, uh, is A thumbtack dotted B honeycomb. This one here is A thumbtack dotted B sheaf, where we just where we have the sheaf B as opposed to the honeycomb B. Okay.
And it's all, they're both real numbers, and in fact, they're both the same real numbers. So I'd like to pause and talk about, okay, well, Meister, Thorne, and Wheeler and Weinreich have two different interpretations of this. What gives? Well, think about in physics for a moment, when we think about the electromagnetic field, we usually think about the lines, the electromagnetic field lines. And we don't think about the electromagnetic field honeycomb. So we're actually kind of used to this picture because, indeed, electromagnetic field lines are, in fact, uh, sheath lines. Uh, but they could very well be honeycomb lines, right? We could have done it that way, but we don't. We think of it this way. So this is actually the more common picture or the, or the picture from which we actually have some experience working with. So let's have a quick look at the relationship. Okay, so to get at this, we're going to have to start back at where we kind of left off when we talked about duality. The answer to this question lies in this notion of duality. So you remember we were always able to con construct these spaces here and likewise we could construct these spaces here. And I always call I call these guys the exterior power spaces these guys are, I call them the exterior powers of the vector space because I, I just want to emphasize just the, that they're different, right? It's still exterior powers, but the ones here involve the dual space. So this is V dual wedge, V dual wedge, V dual. That's the, that's the set that represents the set that is the ex third exterior power. And remember, we're always dealing with three dimensions. So this guy is V dual wedge V dual, and this guy is just V dual. This guy here is the bin of real numbers. This guy is V, this guy is V wedge V, and this guy is V wedge V wedge V. This one has one dimension, this one has three dimensions, this one has, well, let me, I might have to, uh, so I'll write the dimensionality right here, obviously. One dimension, three dimensions, three dimensions, and one dimension. So this is three dimensions, three dimensions, and one dimension. Now we already talked about duality, right? The Hodge dual links this guy to this guy. Now we really we don't really need to talk about the Hodge dual for this purposes of this discussion because we haven't leaned on uh, a metric for anything. Um, from time to time, I've sort of drawn orthogonal vectors and stuff, so I get that, uh, you know, I, I sort of slip in and out of it. But we don't need, we can't really do this linkage because we haven't really stipulated that there must be a metric. So these kind of connections from here to here and from here to here, um, they're not uh, in play right now. But the other kind of duality is definitely in play, and that was the duality that said a rank 2 tensor is the same as a capacitized, a capacitized, um, uh, a rank zero two tensor is the same as a capacitized rank one zero tensor. So this, okay, I had to redraw this. Sorry, so I, I've just redrawn it a little bit neater. One dimension, one dimension, three and three. That's just a coincidence of the fact that we are living in three dimensional space. Okay, so now we don't have the Hodge dual to take us from the uh, zero dimension or the uh, one dimensional scalars to the one dimensional uh, uh, top form, three form or three vector space. We can't go this way or this way because we're really not counting on a metric. On the other hand, we can go from we can go from here to here, uh, from here, well, we can go from here to here or from here to here using the uh, duality with respect to a chosen volume form. So there is a duality from here to here and a duality from here to here that we can exploit. And furthermore, once we have that, we can capacitize or densitize it. And so ultimately, we can create this vector space, V tensor product 
uh, lambda 3 and we can create the dual space tensor product lambda 3. This is a densitized, well a, we'll call it a vector density and this is called a, um, I guess we could call it a covector capacity. It's called a capacity because it's attached to a volume. It's called a density because it's attached to a density. We know that this object is going to um, expand or contract in the opposite, well, with the volume. If the volume goes up, this, this number of things per unit volume goes up. If the volume uh, goes up, if the volume of the coordinate system goes up, then the components of that or the edges of that volume have to go down or the, or the, 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 uh, the number that represents the volume has to go down. So this is in, this one, this is going to get, these guys get determinants of this coordinate change and it's either in the numerator or the denominator uh, depending on which it is. But this guy will expand this guy here will expand with a coordinate increasing volume, which nullifies one of the contractions, one of the directions of contraction here. So this thing, uh, it ends up going as an area. Likewise here, this guy, is, is um, uh, this density is getting bigger with the volume change. But remember, this is an arrow, and arrows get smaller. So it gobbles up one of those changes in exactly the right way, leaving it to be an area. So this thing will change with a change of the coordinate system. You know, if, you, if your coordinate system expands or contracts, just like we talked about earlier, this guy here is going to adjust like an area. This guy here is also going to adjust like an area. So the point is there's a isomorphism from this space, which is the honeycomb space. There's an isomorphism into the vector density. So this is a 0, 2, um, uh, well, this is a 2 form, right? Uh, a 0, 2 anti-symmetric tensor, and it is isomorphic with a 1, 0 vector density. And therefore, we can think about this problem either as honeycombs by having this guy operate on this guy, which is honeycombs penetrating an area, right? This is the thumbtack. Or we can think of this as a vector density, which is a sheaf, right? And uh, going against a covector capacity, which also looks like an area. So, um, and that's this isomorphism going here. It's isomorphic, meaning uh, in, a, in, uh, in, in a quick analysis of isomorphism. Whenever you hear isomorphism, you just think, just think, I can take two members of this set, add them together, and map it to that set. Or I can take two members of this set, map each one, and then add them together in this set, and I get the same answer. That's the way you go both ways. These are isomorphisms with these two. Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler, Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler does everything it can to hang out in here, and Weinreich does everything it can to hang out over here, right? So, um, so that's the difference between this uh, this honeycomb view and this sheaf view. So this lecture has gone on way too long, so we're going to stop now. Um, the next time we're going to finish, we've got our four things, right? We've got our arrows, we've got our, our stacks, we've got our thumbtacks, and uh, we've got our thumbtacks, which I guess is C, and we've got our sheaves, which are also our honeycombs, right? So now we have to do all of the combinations between these things to see if we can create any new objects. The hint is we've created all the uh, vector objects we need. The remaining objects we will create are scalar objects. And we'll describe that uh, next time.